And uh, I want to go back to that because my sermon today will just continue on the same theme. So I want you to open with me your Bibles in Luke chapter 14, verse 33. And most of you know that. Some of you came to, uh, I did two sessions, two presentations for Vespers about the cost of discipleship. And I want to go back to this verse because it's a very, very important verse here. Luke 14 and verse 33, and Jesus says this, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake how much? Say it again, how much? All. All. That he has... He cannot be my disciple. Some people say it's too radical. How can I forsake all? How can I give up all? How can I sacrifice everything? Well, this is what Jesus says. So today I entitled my sermon, Offering a Spiritual Sacrifice. What is God calling us to sacrifice if we want to follow him? If we truly want to be his disciples? If you really don't want to hear this message, because it's going to be radical. I'm going to tell you from the Bible what the Lord is expecting you to sacrifice or to offer on the altar. And some of us are not ready to hear that. And some of us are not ready to make that step to really enter into this discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ and be willing to sacrifice everything for him. Two friends were walking. You probably heard this story, but it illustrates the point very well. Two friends were walking in the forest one day when suddenly they stumbled upon a large grizzly bear uh, who decided that they looked very good for a snack. So they, they start running away from the grizzly bear and they're running and running and one point, at one point one of them stops. And the other one, the other friend says, uh, what are you doing? Uh, why are you stopping? Don't you know the grizzly bear is right behind us? And his, fr uh, you know, his friend replied, I'm tying my shoelace so I can run faster. At this, the other friend could not help but laugh. And he said, what do you think? You will outrun the grizzly bear? And the friend replied, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. I only have to outrun you. Too often today we act like this friend. Our selfish, self-centered culture and society dictates that. I have to look up for whom? For me, the number one. I don't care about anybody else. That's what this self-centered culture dictates. Most of the times we point the fingers out there. It's the culture, it's the society out there. But when you point out how many fingers point back, Quite a few more fingers point back to us. So I don't think that the church is safe from this as well. There is a lot of self-centeredness in our church as well. There is a lot of selfishness in our churches as well. This self-centered nature and selfish attitude is prevalent in our churches today. But the Bible presents a completely different picture a life of a Christian is a life of sacrifice. If you truly want to follow Jesus, we need to sacrifice things. Now, I'll be talking about offerings. And I wanted to go back in the Bible and see the offerings in the Bible in the, in the Old Testament. So, in the Bible, offering a sacrifice is always associated with worship. You come to worship God to the sanctuary, to the temple, you bring what? You bring an offering, you bring a sacrifice. Worship always meant sacrifice. From the very beginning, worshiping God meant bringing an offering to Him. And when we look at the Old Testament, we see that the first recorded act of worship was by Cain and Abel. And what did they do? They brought what? A sacrifice. Every time you come to worship, Every time you worship God, you bring a sacrifice, an offering unto the Lord. Throughout the history of Israel, God's people erected altars to bring sacrifices. I want you to open with me Psalm 96 and verse 8. 
to worship God is to bring an offering to him. And this is what Psalmist said in uh, chapter 96 and verse 8. And it says, Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring a what? Bring an offering and come into his court. In other ways, in other words, bring an offering and come and worship him. Worship is always associated with an offering, with a sacrifice. Worship is not to be considered just getting from God because that's what we think about. We always say, I'm coming to worship God. I want to get what? I want to get a blessing. We always think about worship as getting and receiving something. Worship is about offering. Worship is about giving. And we don't have that mentality about worship. It is clear that Christians are to continually sacrifice to the Lord as part of their worship. Unfortunately, most of us today think of worship as coming to the worship hour on Sabbath morning. Most of us think that this is the time to worship, and it is a time to worship, but is this the only time for worship? No, but we think that this is the time to worship. We, bring, we come and worship God, but this is only a small, small part of the whole worship. We as Christians often talk about the worship experience we had at the church. We think that we have come for one hour to worship and we say we have recharged our spiritual batteries. Now we are good for a whole week. Have you heard people saying that? I heard it many times. Let me tell you, this is good only for one day. <laughs> it's one day charge. That's it. If you think that coming here for one hour or two hours to church to worship and you have recharged your spiritual batteries for the whole week, you are wrong. This recharge needs to happen through worship every day. Every day of your week, everything that you do is an act of worship. Because worship is everything that we do in our lives to bring glory to God is an act of worship. Our lives is in our worship. Our worship has to become a lifestyle. Everything that we do is an act of worship. One of the doctrines of the New Testament is the priesthood of all believers. Have you heard about priesthood of all believers? I want you to open with me in 1 Peter 2 verse 5. 1 Peter 2 verse 5. And it says there, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, I'll give you a few seconds to find, or for Bob to find it and put it on the screen. And it says there, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a what? A holy what? Priesthood to offer up spiritual what? Sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The text here is saying that if you're a Christian, you belong to what? To a priesthood. You are a priest. Each and every one of us is a priest. I know that a lot of people refer to only the pastors as being priests. No, everyone is a priest. If you have accepted Christ, you become a part of a priesthood. And what was the main, one of the main duties of priests in the Old Testament? To offer sacrifices, right? So as a spiritual priest, each and every one of you has a duty to offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. So today, I'm going to look at a few spiritual sacrifices from the Word of God, what we can offer to God, each and every one of, each and every one of us. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. This is the first offer to the Lord that we can give to him. Hebrews 13 and verse 15, and it says there, Therefore by him, or through him, which is talking about Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of what? Sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This doesn't mean that it's just a mere singing during the praise time, all right, when we are at church. 
Offering the praise with our lips, it doesn't mean that we're just singing praises to God when we're here on Sabbath morning. It means everything that comes out of our mouth should be an offer of praise to God. Every word that comes out of our mouth should be a praise to God. Now, but you know that Luke 6.45 says, For out of the abundance of the heart, what? His mouth speaks. So where does the words, where do the words originate? In your heart. So when you say that our words, our lips should speak, give an offer of praise, it should start with, it should start with our heart. This is a very important point because Jesus once again reinforces this idea in Matthew 15 and verse 8 to 9 where he says, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and you know this verse, and he continues, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is what? Far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So just worshiping and praising God with your lips is not enough. A lot of people can say a lot of things. But it all depends where your heart is. It all depends where your heart is. God does not accept this type of worship when we praise him only with our lips and our heart is far from him. God is not pleased with this type of sacrifice. In Hebrews 13 verse 15 that we just read, Apostle Paul encouraged us to offer the sacrifice of praise continually. It is not just a church where praise from our lips is supposed to happen. The reason it's called a sacrifice of praise is because it's not going to always be convenient where we simply feel like doing it. That's why it's a sacrifice. Do you praise God only when you're doing well in your life? That's easy to do. That's not a sacrifice. <laughs> you're not sacrificing anything when you're praising God just when it's you're doing well. When it's a sacrifice, when it's not convenient, and when you don't feel like praising God, when you're going through, through trials and tribulations, and, when, and you say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I'll still praise you. That is a sacrifice. When you don't feel like praising God, this is what Apostle Paul is talking about. And he says this type of sacrifice has to be continual. When was the last time you felt like praising God for trials in your lives? Not too often. We, we don't really do that. But God is encouraging us through his word to bring an offering of praise. Another aspect here is, does every word that is coming out of our mouth is a praise to God? <laughs> Some people say, I have problems with my, my tongue. <laughs> I have problems with my mouth. I'm a Christian, but it's hard to control my tongue. Have you, ha have you had that problem before? Controlling your tongue. You know, James talks about controlling the tongue. And he says it's one of the smallest part in your mouth, but can do what? Kindle fires. Great fires. It can start great fires. Because... Instead of offering every word to God as a sacrifice, we become self-centered. And when comes, what comes out of our mouth is not a sacrifice of praise anymore to God. Everything, every word that comes out of our mouth must constitute a praise to God. There is a Scottish preacher by the name Alexander Wyatt, and he always began his prayers with an expression of gratitude. And on one cold, miserable day, his people wondered what he would say when he was going to pray. Is he still going to praise God for this miserable, cold day? And he started at this, at the prayer, and he prayed, We thank thee, O Lord, that it is not always like this. <laughs> Very good way to praise God, right? Do we always give God an offering of praise? It is our language at home, at work, at church, with our spouse, with our children, with our friends. It is the offering of our lips. This is what 
this passage is talking about. Every word that comes out of our mouth has to be a praise to the Lord, an offering to Him. And that offering must be brought how often? Continually. Continually. So let's move on to another offering that we're talking today. Hebrews 13 and verse 16. If you go back to Hebrews, we read verse 15. I want you to open there and read verse 16. And Paul says there, But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well what? Pleased. So what is the next sacrifice that Paul is encouraging us to offer? Our good works is an offering to God that God is well pleased with. Doing good. And it's interesting that Paul is saying here, right in the beginning, but do not what? Do not forget. And the question is, can we really forget to do good? Can we forget that? Apparently we can, because Paul is encouraging the readers to say, do not forget, because he probably saw these things happening, and he says, don't forget to do good. I'm sure as human beings we have every possibility to forget to do good because our nature is what? It's selfish. And as, as we need to every day give that to God and ask God to take care of our, our selfish, carnal nature, that's why it's an offering, it's a sacrifice. Because we as humans want to do, good, do things only for ourselves. And that's why God is saying here, no, you have to sacrifice that self-desire and try to do good to others. And that's why God is saying, do not forget to do good things. But not all the good deeds of men are pleasing or acceptable to God. A clear example of that is the Pharisees. How did the Pharisees understand the good works? How did they understand them? They do good works to, to what? To earn salvation, right? So they had a wrong understanding of a good, good works. I'm doing good works in order, in order to earn something. They believe by, by doing good, they can earn salvation. That is why their good works were not acceptable to God. So if we cannot earn any recognition of heaven by, for our good works. What are the reasons for doing good works? Let me give you three quick reasons. First, the reason that we find in the Bible is in Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Why, if we don't earn salvation through our good works, why should I bother doing those things? Ephesians 2 and verse 10, and it says here, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It says here that we are created in God's image and the likeness of God to do what? To do good to others. And those good works have been prepared for us in advance by God. This is a very interesting point because what Paul is saying here that we have been created in the likeness of God and the purpose why we are created like that is to do good works. In other words, we are created to represent one of the aspects of God's nature and that is his goodness. So every time you do good to others, you are representing God because you are created in God's image, right? And every time you do good, you represent one of aspects of God's character, which is his goodness. So that's why we do good. Number two reason for doing good things is found in Galatians 6 and verse 9. And I want you to open with me Galatians 6 verse 9. Galatians 6 verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing what? In doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. It's the same language. Remember, he said in, in Hebrews first, he said, do not forget to do good things. And here he says at the end, you will reap a harvest. So second reason for doing good works is because it produces a harvest. But the interesting thing here is 
Can we really become tired or weary in doing good things? Have you ever been tired of doing good? Some people say, I'm tired doing good things to people when they don't respond back to me. Have you heard people saying that? That's the main reason why people get tired doing good things, because our selfish nature dictates what? If I'm doing good to you, you have to what? Respond and do good back to me. That's the selfish nature in us. All right? And that's why Paul knew about that. He said, do not get tired and don't give up on doing good things because I know how you feel. I know how you feel when you've done so many good things and nobody did anything good for you. And sometimes even it happens, you're doing good things to people and they respond with what? With bad things. <laughs> and that hurts even more. And what Paul is saying here, I know that. I know it happens, but as an, a follower of Christ... If you really want to give an offering of good works, you must not give up on doing good things. The third reason, this is the second reason why we're doing good works. Because we want to be pleasing to God and we want to continue doing things no matter what happens because it will produce a good harvest. Let us move on to the third point we are offering to God our possessions. I want you to open with me Philippians 4 and verse 18. And now we're going to get a little bit more personal here. When it comes to possessions, our finances, people get very personal. All right? Philippians 4 and verse 18. This is the third thing that we are called to offer to God as a spiritual sacrifice. Philippians 4 and verse 18. And it says there, Indeed, I have all and abound, says Paul, I am full having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet what? Smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You see the same language is repeating all the time, well-pleasing to God, an acceptable, well-pleasing to God. This is what happens here. Epaphroditus was sending some financial support to Paul, and then he responds and he says, I've received that, and I'm grateful for that because I abound from those things that he sent me. And what he has done for me, that financial support is a well-pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Did you know that there are th over 31,000 verses in the Bible, probably heard the statistics, about 500 of them talk about faith, 500 of them talk about prayer, 1,000 talk about love, 700 of them talk about peace. But on money and money man management, there are over 2,385 verses in the whole Bible. That's almost 7.7% of the, all the verses in the Bible talk about finances. 15% of Jesus' words and 23 of the 40 parables of Jesus talk about money, talk about finances. Why so much emphasis on money? <laughs> Some of you might wonder, and I'm looking at Jeff, <laughs> why so much emphasis on finances, some of you might say, why is God talking so much about finances? Let me give you three reasons. Reason number one, God knew we would have trouble managing our money. <laughs> and that we would spend a great amount of time earning and spending and investing it. And he knew that we'll have trouble with that. So God wanted us to make sure we know how to invest properly and wisely, you know, manage our finances. Reason number two is that money has a profound effect on interpersonal relationships. Have you found that in your family sometimes? How finances can spark some arguments? Did you know that finances is probably second or third reason why divorces happen? <laughs> Marriages fall apart. Relationships fall apart because of this topic of finances. That's why God knew about this. That's why he put it in the word, in his word, so we can read about this. But the third reason is the most important one. The third reason is that we, the way we use our money is a real measure of our commitment to Christ. 
Money is an outside indicator, said someone, of an inside spiritual condition. Let me read that again. Finances, money, and the way we use our finances is an inside indicator, uh, is an outside indicator of an inside spiritual condition. Scripture relates money to the love of God in 1 John 3, 17, and it says there, but whoever has the world's goods, and this is coming back to the video we saw today, and I still can't forget those images. It says here, but whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? A tough verse to swallow. But it is true that our finances and the way we use our finances is an outside indicator of an inside spiritual condition. We can assume an appearance of spirituality when we pray, right? <laughs> we can assume an appearance of spirituality in our Christian service. We can assume uh, you know, an appearance of spirituality in our Bible knowledge, but we cannot fake the way we use our money. It really is one of the best indicators of our spiritual conditions. Our wallet reveals more about our character and walk with the Lord than we may think. In 1815, some of you remember from history, Napoleon was defeated in the Battle of Waterloo. You study that in history books. And the hero of that battle was Duke of Wellington, right? And uh, he was the mastermind behind that battle that was won against Napoleon. <clears throat> The Duke's most recent biographer claims to have an advantage over all other previous biographers that wrote about Duke of Ellington. And the reason is because he had found an old account ledger that showed how the Duke had spent his money all his life. That, says the biographer, was a far better clue to what the Duke thought was really important than reading his letters or his speeches. <laughs> Because you can see where whatever is important in your life, this is where you're going to invest your money into. So you will know where the heart lies by the way this person spent the money. Now the question is, can you imagine if someone wrote your biography on the, on the basis of your checkbook or your income tax return? Just imagine that. Only your accountant knows that. <laughs> but imagine if somebody wrote your life biography based on your checkbook, on your bank statement, and on your tax income you know, return. I'm not sure what that would say about us. I'm not sure what it would say. What it would say about our loyalties, our focus in life about whom you serve. What would that say? So I really invite you to think about that. Billy Graham says that a checkbook is a theological document. <laughs> he says it tells who and what you worship. A checkbook is a theological document. It tells who and how you worship. Some strong words, but very valid words. Because once again, the way you use your finances is an outside indicator of an inside spiritual condition. The Lord is calling us to put that on the altar and offer it to him. He said in the word that this is a sweat, uh, uh, it's an acceptable uh, worship and offering to him. A worship lifestyle includes offering to God our possessions. Let's look at the last point, Romans 12 verse 1. Romans 12 and verse 1. This is the last point I'm going to make about what God is calling us to offer to him today as his followers, as Christians. And you all know this verse very, very well. Romans 12 and verse 1. What does the Bible say there? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present what? Your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, 
which is your what? Reasonable service. So is it reasonable to give to God everything you have? <laughs> That's what the Word of God says. This is your reasonable service. In other words, Paul says here, he's saying to us, we are to offer all that we are, all that we have, every part of our life to God. We no longer belong to ourselves, but we belong to whom? We belong to God. Offer your lives to God. Offer your body as an acceptable and holy offering to Him. You know, the recipients of these letters knew that in the temple, the offerings were offered how long? In the morning and in the evening. That's why it was a continual offering. And that's why they knew when Paul is saying, I'm inviting you, I'm encouraging you to offer your lives as a reasonable offering to God. They knew what Paul meant. They knew that he's inviting them to offer continually their lives to the Lord. Make sure you put your life on the, on the altar of the Lord. You have to do this daily. You have to daily make a commitment to God to offer your lives to Him. This was not once a week offering. This wasn't just a five minutes a day offering in the morning when you're reading the Bible. This is a continual worship to God, offering your lives to Him. When Paul is talking about offering your lives on the sacrifice, as a sacrifice, when the sinner brought an offering and laid it on the altar, did the, did the animal have a choice to say no? No, the animal didn't have a choice. What is different with us is we do have a choice. We do have a choice. We can make this intelligent and deliberate choice every day to serve God and put our lives on the altar. And that's the difference between the animal offering and us as an offering. We are to choose every day to surrender our lives to God, not just once in a while or only for a few little moments every day. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 147 says this. The duty and delight of all service is to uplift Christ before the people. This is the end of all true labor. Let Christ appear. Let self be hidden behind him. This is self-sacrifice that is of worth. This is the sacrifice that the Lord is expecting from us. Let me read that last part again. Let Christ appear. Let self be hidden behind him. This is the self-sacrifice that, that is of worth. In conclusion, there are three different words that describe an offering in the Old Testament. An offering is described with three adjectives. First one, without blemish or holy. Second one, continual. And third one, pleasing to God. These are the three words that are, the offering is described in the Old Testament. So when we offer our spiritual sacrifices today, our spiritual sacrifices, our offerings must be described the same way with these three adjectives. When we offer a sacrifice to the Lord today, it must be holy or without blemish. We must give to the Lord the best of our praise. We must give to the Lord the best of our possession, the best of our good works, and the best of our lives. Sometimes we give to the Lord what? What is left? But the Lord is asking for the best that you have. A sacrifice must be holy. It must be the best thing you can offer to God. When we offer our spiritual sacrifices to the Lord, it must be continual. We must never stop offering our praise, our good works, our possession, and our lives to God. When we offer our sacrifices to the Lord today, they must be pleasing or acceptable to the Lord. And the question I have for you today is, are your sacrificing, sacrifices pleasing to God? Are they acceptable in His sight? Is your praise, your good works, your possessions and your life pleasing to the Lord? And I want you to think about those things. Remember Luke 14, 33 in the beginning I read? It said what? If you don't give all to the Lord, you cannot be His disciple. <laughs> this is what it means to sacrifice all to the Lord. 
I want you to think very seriously about what God is calling you to sacrifice or to surrender to Him today. And the question that I want to leave you with is, are you willing to offer your life as a living sacrifice to God? May God bless you. Amen.